Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Don and Chris joining you today as uh, we're going to do a little exploration that is, I guess, recent history is a good way to describe this, Chris. Although I just realized I'm looking at the dates here is not quite as recent as I want to believe it is in my head. I was a kid when this happened, and I'm not a kid anymore, I guess, is going to be my my point for this. Um, not, 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 not to make anybody, not to be ageist, I didn't exist. I understand. I was about yeah. to go there, Chris. You, yeah. you, weren't even, you weren't even alive when this happened. And so what we're going to be talking about today is an incident that happened in 1979. In fact, it was March of 1979, and it was the Three Mile Island nuclear uh, facility incident, Three Mile Island in uh, Pennsylvania. In fact, I remember as a kid, Chris, in 1980, my family took a vacation uh, to where you live, the Washington, D.C. area. And it was a driving vacation, and that was actually during one of the uh, oil blips, crises Mm -hmm. kind of thing that was going on. In fact, it actually may have been, now that I think about it, it was in 79 that we took that trip. It wasn't 80 now that I think about that. It was the summer of 79, so not long after this event. And I remember that one of the things that happened as we were crossing back across Pennsylvania on the famed Pennsylvania Turnpike, and looked off to the right because we're heading from the east to the west and we could see those very distinctive nuclear stack type things and i remember looking on the map as a uh, as an 11 year old because i was responsible at that point for being the the map guidance person that's a whole other story for a whole other time about the time my my mom was having us look for a hotel in the wrong state and after that the map responsibilities were handed over to me as a kid but the um I remember looking at that and going, what's that? And I go, oh, that's Three Mile Island. And I remember the expression on my parents' face. And I, of course, had remembered the event from March of that year. And the fact that we were that close to Three Mile Island, I think my dad may have put a heavier foot on the accelerator. I'm just saying, I think that may have happened. Uh, But the Three Mile Island event, probably the most, by definitely by far the most famous American nuclear Mm -hmm. power incident. We'll talk a little bit. Well, I'm, I know we'll talk about others as we move along here because we were talking about them off podcast. But the concept here today, Chris, is looking at a historical what if of what if there had not been a three mile island event mm-hmm. and where would things be now with nuclear power? And the last thing I'll say here, and I'll let Chris get a word in edgewise here as I'm getting us set up is uh, here in, in Texas, where I live this past week, we were actually asked by our electricity grid to conserve power as much as possible because the extreme heat that we're having here in the early part of the Texas summer was going to be putting a strain on the capacity of the grid. So we were asking to be good consumers and conserve because there was concern about um, demand exceeding capacity. And that's always a result of what do you have for capacity? And we have a mix of here in the Texas grid, a unique grid that's not connected to any other grid in the United States. That's a whole other thing, not for this podcast, but for a whole other discussion. Uh, You know, we have a number of sources. We have a nuclear power plant, the South Texas project. We have gas-fired plants. There's still a few coal-fired plants. We have wind, solar. We have a number of different sources here. But the realization of we don't have as much power, obviously, just sitting around, or else the uh, ERCOT would not have been asking us to conserve. And so I began to wonder, how would things be different if there had been a different course or trajectory for nuclear power here in the United States, and that caused me to think about Three Mile Island. So this is the part where I shut up, Chris, and let you get a word in edgewise. A word didn't, even in let edgewise. You say, didn't even let you say hi to the good people. Yeah, well, I will <laughs> say both hi to the good people and a word edgewise. There you go. <laughs> so what do you remember, having not been born, Chris, but what do you remember from, from history and study and other things about Three Mile Island? When I say that, what pops into your mm-hmm. head? Um, well, I, I, I need to look and see if we have any listeners in the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area before I really get into my feelings on it. Um, 
before I really started to dig and, and understand it, it was a partial meltdown. And I did not really get the difference between it and Chernobyl. When I started learning about these two things, um, they were the, the, the only two that had happened. This was before Fukushima. And th- they were both partial meltdowns. That's the extent of what I knew. And there you go. Uh, and and for me, I, I guess I was a Chernobyl was in eighty five. Is that right? Eighty. I want to say eighty six because I think Gorbachev was already. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, Chernobyl is eighty six. So these are seven years apart. And by the way, I didn't realize this until doing a little bit of research here. Uh, the International Nuclear, the INES, has a seven level scale. With one being the least impactful, seven being the most impactful. Uh, Chernobyl ranks a seven. It's a major accident, as as it should, and you would might well imagine. Mm-hmm. There's portions of the former Soviet Union that to this day are not inhabited and will not be inhabited for, let's just say, basically from our all intents and purposes forever <laughs> in mm-hmm. terms of being able to be safely inhabited there. Uh, Three Mile Island was a five, so not a minor thing, but also not to the same level of Chernobyl. And the area of contamination, the release of the radioactive gas at Three Mile Island versus what happened at Chernobyl in terms of the size of the impact area, very, very, very Mm -hmm. different. But the point being there, anytime you're dealing with nuclear power and the risk associated with it, a little bit of problem goes a really, 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 really long way and lasts for a really, really, really long time. The curious thing when we were talking off podcast, I know, Chris, and sort of getting ready to record here is we started looking into some of the statistics about nuclear power consumption around the world. And you threw a statistic at me. You asked me in the form of a question to take a guess. And I was shocked. Uh, Do they use any nuclear power in France, Chris? (laughs) Yes. Um, France is. Just just to put the because I already have the number, I'm going to say 75 percent. It was 74 point five percent of all of their power generation is nuclear. And on the other end or one of the other end of the scales, by the way, it's about 30 percent globally was the number that I came across here. And the United States has topped out at approximately what, 20, 25 ish percent of capacity of what's there i'm looking at the chart that i sent over to you chris now i just Mm got to get it open here but as of 2022 we were just under 20 percent, about 18 Mm percent of uh of of u.s um uh electricity was being generated by nuclear so big difference between 75 and let's call it 18 percent even though there's a difference in terms of the geographic size, of the two countries difference in population of the two countries, it'd be a fair thing to say that France has embraced nuclear technology and the United States, which went from um, a little bit over 5% in the early 1970s up to the number, this number peaked at about 20 percent and is down now down to about 18% really remained unchanged from about 19. 19- 1985 on so sort of two different trajectories or two different paths here the one thing i'd, I'd say you, you're saying we were at five percent in a ra- a little bit around 1970 ish um that i think is largely because when did i, I want to say civilian nuclear power didn't exist until the 1960s it right. was a it was after we developed nuclear power for other purposes um, right and 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 i think the big thing to think about uh, you know to keep in mind here is nuclear power is generated by a reaction by setting off a nuclear bomb inside enough concrete with enough controls that it doesn't become uncontrolled right Th- that's that's what it is 
that you know you keep hearing about cold we've discovered hot fusion that that's you know, we, 1950 we we've we've done that um cold fusion or fusion as a power source is something that we've been working on for the past 70 80 years trying to figure out how to control it because right. if we can do it controlled i mean the byproduct's water right <laughs> And and no waste to figure out where, you know, where you're going to mm -hmm. stick it that has to be, you know, quarantined and put where it's put mm -hmm. for literally millions of years to lose its lose its potential negative impact to human beings. And so, again, we're an alternate history podcast. So we've talked a little bit about the history of it here. So the concept we want to explore here as a as an alternate path is assuming that the Three Mile Island incident in 79 is not an incident that receives the public notice and is a threat uh, to, to safety without a release there. So the concept is, you know, some of the things that failed an open relief valve that caused this, they lost, uh, you know, they lost uh, the appropriate amount of, of coolant uh, for that there that led them to having the partial meltdown. What we're going to assume here is our point of departure is that they may have had some type of problem with the valve. Valves fail. Things go wrong all the time. But that all the systems, backups and alarms do what they're supposed to do in such a way that it wasn't an incident that caused them to need to shut down the plant for a period of time. They make the usual reports they're supposed to make to the various regulatory commissions. So they, those things get incorporated into safety guidelines and designs of future systems. And that what happens is there's no three mile Island in our, in our, in our nation's energy history uh, to be an impact there. And so that, that's going to be our simple point of departure. And having said that, as we were starting to do the research here because we were curious, it wasn't until 2012 that the next new construction of a nuclear power plant um, was approved. And, and Chris, you were the one who had some personal knowledge of this. It really was just new, new, it was just new nuclear uh, reactors at an existing site, right? Right, right. Uh, you mentioned a little bit when we were talking and and this is something to think about when it comes to the uh, French model, or or why is France so into nuclear? Um, you can only build nuclear by water. Nuclear needs a lot of fresh water to cool it, right. so you can't really build it in the middle of some places. Um, it just so happens that humans also need a lot of fresh water. So it just so happens that where you have cities, you happen to have that resource, I guess. Right, right. Or, or in the case of the one, the one facility that we have here in Texas was actually built along the Gulf Coast, where it had mm -hmm. the benefit of river water, and then you know, in theory, there's you know, there's salt water that could be you know, desalinized or something like that if you really absolutely had to at a pitch. But that's an excellent point. And so, the thing that we wanted to discuss in this particular historical what is it, what would be different, right? And so one of the things that's there is we were on a pace or a course for nuclear, obviously, to become a bigger part of electrical generation. So I'm going to assume here, and it's you know, there's no good reason for this assumption that we probably would have at least gotten up to the 30, 40 percent range at the pace that we were going, maybe not embracing as much as France has or did, but that we were certainly on a track to have more instead of just the stop that suddenly not until 2012 that there's even uh even by the way, that was right after the Fukushima event in 2011. And so there was even some concern about doing that. So let's just say we end up with 40% of our power generation, Chris, let's say coming from nuclear, just to throw a number out there for our historical what if about double what it is now. And the that had grown, let's say, by the, let's just say 2000-ish period of time, 20, 20 years, 25 years, you know, but certainly you can see the path that's there. Would things be different if we had 20% of our electricity coming from that as a source versus where we get it today? I know you had some things you thought might have been impacted. What's the first thing that pops into your head? Um, the first place I went was this. Uh was this but I'm a little surprised that your family took the road trip they did in the summer of 79. Um, were you cognizant at that age of what gas was? Yes. And it was it was interesting. I remember that trip so well in a lot of ways. We had planned to do it. And I think they had. 
they had had, my mom and dad had had some thoughts about maybe not taking it. But one of the things I remembered was during that summer, of course, as the, the gas shortage came along, rationing came into, into effect and odd even rationing came into effect. And so here we were, one of the things that we had that broke in our favor in some of the states that were doing gas rationing that summer while we were on that trip was that um, out of state plates didn't fall under the odd the odd even rationing rationale in terms of being able to get it. So we were at least able to get gas every day. And we had originally planned to go further up into New England during that trip. I uh, say we, we made it, we, DC was on the itinerary. We turned around at DC to head back because of concern about getting further away from home on this driving vacation. And would we be able to get the gas to get back? And I can also remember dad buying a gas can. This was not safe. We had a 1977 uh, Mercury station wagon uh, with like the wood paneling side. It's the family truckster from uh, from vacation uh, in a blue and wood version versus the green one that's there, if you want to think about it that way. And dad knew this was unsafe and he was concerned about doing it. And it was part of my job being in the back there, but there was no trunk to put it in. And so we had a gas can that <laughs> at least had a little bit in it just in just in case because dad was going to be be cautious about that so yeah we uh, to your point i'm surprised we took that trip too but we didn't take quite the trip we originally planned to take as a result of what was going on what was going on um i guess you were, do you remember the first shock in 73 i remember that as a very small child you know the gas okay. lines you know like i can remember you know you just couldn't go and you know fill up mm -hmm. like you wanted to uh kind of thing so yes i do remember that and then remember the subsequent, you know, 79 um, uh, shortage and, you know, what was going on there. Mm -hmm. Similar sources, different sources, you know, that were part of what was happening in terms of, you know, they were geopolitical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it wasn't because there wasn't, you know, oil to be to be brought out of the ground and gas to be produced. It was about where the supply was coming from, primarily in the Middle East. So to get on those, to touch on those two, 73 was the Yom Kippur War. Right. Uh, the United States and the West supported Israel. The Arab nations and the Soviet Union did not. And so it was um, the embargo. And they decided and, and it kind of dawned on a lot of the Gulf Arab states specifically that we have this massive resource that we've just been handing out. And if we decide to stop doing that, maybe we'll become important. Um, 79 is because of the Iranian revolution, right? And all through the 1980s, you have, and I was very clear when, when I talked about this as the first Persian Gulf war, because I've heard it referred to as the first Persian Gulf war, not kind of my earlier memories of what happened in 91, but throughout the 1980s during the Iran Iraq war. The United States Navy, along with other Western navies, was in an undeclared war in the Persian Gulf against Iran that was trying to disrupt oil shipments out of the Persian Gulf. Basically. I don't think that's that important because... You know, when we talked a little bit, the United States, despite what most people would really think, the United States doesn't import a lot of oil. I, there are years I don't think it imports any. Thank you, Texas. Thank you, Alaska. <laughs> um, in, ter in, ter in terms of net imports. Right. There, there's, there's all coming in, but there's all going out. Right, right. Um. The United States has those domestic sources. Europe doesn't, and they are the ones that are really can really be, you know, as we're seeing right now with the concern over their maintenance of the Russian sanctions. They're the ones that are really adapt th that are really sensitive to it, but it is a global market, like you said, and if we don't use it here we have it to sell somewhere else so specifically if the united states is not using 
oil domestically to produce its power because it's scared of nuclear. That then becomes an export industry that we can use strategically to sp- support friendly governments as opposed to leaving them on the open market, paying whatever unfriendly, unstable governments want to charge them. Yeah, and and, and just to be clear, you know, you, you made the reference there to oil, and oil mm. is certainly burnt or consumed for electricity generation. It really is the entire energy complex that sort of gets, you know, wrapped up in this mm-hmm. where nuclear nuclear displaces some of the electricity generation in such a way that the fuels or the other the other sources can go towards other means without mm-hmm. it being all tied together. And um it's you know it's it's complicated that way because I you know was in this industry or related to this industry for a good portion of my work career and you know one of things about electricity they talk about is your base load generation and that's sort of what you you know what is always on because it's the hardest thing to start up and it's the hardest thing to shut down and so um nuclear tends to be one of the primary base loads where you have it for electricity because you start the reactors and you and, and you don't stop the reactors the nature of what they do means that they're there all along and then you use other fuels to adjust for demand like for example here in texas we're now heavily dependent upon natural gas to be what picks up our peak demand now because you can turn natural gas electricity uh, generators on and off relatively quickly compared to nuclear and nuclear is far more dependable than solar and wind energy because the nuclear reactor works all the time it's not waiting for the wind to blow or the sun to shine as long as it has power coming in correct <laughs> with, and, you're, which, and you're able to balance where the power is and where you need the power to be which, which is a whole other thing which interestingly enough now that i'm thinking about it that's actually the problem in the other two nuclear incidents that really happened, Fukushima and uh, Chernobyl, not Three Mile Island, but um, that that's also what led to, as I understood it, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, some of the problems a l- couple of winters ago mm-hmm. with the it, it, it's it's you need it, th- this is very counterintuitive. It takes energy to make energy. Well, and the other thing I remember learning for the mm-hmm. first time uh, in the um, uh, when I was in that business is, you know, electricity doesn't always just flow the way you want to. Sometimes you have to actually flow electricity back in the direction opposite of where you're taking it mm-hmm. to. And, it, you know, it's inefficient in the way that it flows across. It's not like a fluid in a pipeline that mm-hmm. you just pump it to where you need to go. And so these, you know, having stable baselines are are important part of this. And of course, we've gotten off into, you know, the science, the technology, but the where this is relevant back to what we're talking about, if you've got 40% of your electricity coming from nuclear, that's a very stable 40% that's across mm-hmm. the board that you rely upon it, regardless of the season, regardless of the time, regardless of other things, it is your base load. Now, when you have peaks and demands because of, uh, summer cooling, winter heating, all of those things that can impact what's going on with that. Yeah, you do have to have mm-hmm. capacity come online to meet the demand, but your baseline demand is being handled by this, mm-hmm. by the way, very expensive and takes a long time to build anybody technology. That's, anybody that has played Sims that he knows that. Yeah, but once you have it, the relative cost over the mm-hmm. life of the facility is economically feasible and it's uh and it's a little bit of fuel goes a long way ask mm-hmm. a u.s nuclear carrier out out at sea how long they can go because they're nuclear and they don't have to worry about stopping in at a port if they're mm-hmm. actually in a, in a fighting war right that's the whole point so that's 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 actually a good tie-in back to what i was just what we were kind of talking about is maybe we don't need to have so many of those nuclear carriers over in the middle east if we are less dependent on that oil. Right. Um, that, the, the, that goes through my mind. The other thing, you know, one, once you get talking about the oil economy and, and a decrease in demand there, the other thing I talked about was right after this happens in the 1980s, the Soviet economy has kind of ground to a halt. It just isn't working. And 
they do have a lot of natural gas and a lot of oil, which is basically how they survive as long as they wound up surviving. They're able to and and as you mentioned yourself, Don, the the, the that extract of an export economy is what's allowed. When is this being released again? <laughs> almost instant, almost instantaneously. So we're recording the weekend of what we'll call the the group the group uh, group Wagner Fund or Group Wagner Wagner Fund in yeah. uh, in, in 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 Russia. Um. So as as of recording, he's still the president. Um, Putin was able to export a lot of that gas, and he's used it up up until recently. He used it very adroitly to both prop up his economy and, like I was talking about with the OPEC seventy three embargo, he's been able to use it as an effective cudgel against nations that he wanted to cudgel right um if they don't have that kind of demand i.e the united states is able to like i said you know meet europe's demands maybe it's harder for the soviet union to survive maybe it doesn't survive as long as it did or you know, it, it, it is good that we're recording it this weekend because, gee, instability anywhere in that side of the world creates a lot of problems. Yeah. And uh, and yeah. But, and, the, and the other thing that occurred to me is, you know, I just thought about this because it's also been one of the uh, things that's happened in the last 15 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, fracking and the, the ability to the, the natural get being being you know, drowning, so to speak, in natural gas domestically in the United States, which has been the phenomenon of the last 10 to 15 years in terms of supply for natural gas. But, you know, one of the things that, that flipped there was up until the regulatory change, uh, the U.S. had two facilities. One of them is not far from me. It's over at Sabine Pass, mm-hmm. a company called, French company, by the way, <laughs> called Chenier, uh, had a, 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 a natural gas importation facility there and it wasn't until the change in regulation and the law in the u.s i guess that was in the late aughts where we were they were allowed then to build natural gas liquefaction plants to export lng which is you know that's been the big thing in the last 10 to 15 years and part of the reason we were willing to do that is we had so much natural gas we didn't feel like we needed to hold on to all of it for domestic needs we had enough we could we could turn it into an exportable commodity and be okay with you know i think if you go back and rewind you know back to a different path for nuclear not cut off or topped off because of the concerns following 3 mile island and on the heels of that chernobyl um, is that you have a scenario where we may have been more willing to become a natural gas exporter as a nation, meaning the United States earlier. And so now to your point, Chris, if there's more natural, if we're building those facilities, which by the way, take five, six years to build and to be able to do that and supply, you don't do this overnight. You don't turn on the ability to ship natural gas across the ocean that quickly, like you can with a pipeline Mm -hmm. from the Soviet Union or from Russia. But if there's the ability, according to him, those had all those problems. Those were constantly getting shut off. Yeah, exactly. Is that you, you have the potential where maybe in the, late 80s certainly by the 90s where the europe is going we got to have natural gas you know we got plenty of it (laughs) and And the united states is able to in the same way that you know today you hear about saudi arabia intentionally pumping gas to keep the price low to prevent that hard capital from going to iran Right. You could have the United States subsidizing and developing that natural gas to keep Europe coming to, like I said, the kind of places we want them coming to for these things. Right. And, you know, so, you know, thinking through, you know, again, the whole idea is what what if no Three Mile Island is that, you know, I think you have a different 
potential structure of an electricity and electricity generation market in the U.S. By the way, another way that this plays out, also tying back into the dependence upon oil to produce gasoline for transportation needs, is that if, if electricity is more plentiful, cheaper, or at least consistent in terms of its ability to be produced at a particular price because a larger portion of the base load is nuclear. You know, what happens maybe to an acceleration 10 to 15 years ahead of the curb of the electric car market, where suddenly you're looking and going, is this a, you know, is this a better alternative because of what we have available here, all the things that are happening there? Maybe you have different governmental, you know, we, a lot of what we know about that here in the U.S. and globally as well is a lot of it depends on what tax incentives governments mm -hmm. are creating for the manufacturers of those vehicles to do what they're doing. But maybe you have a different mix in that. And suddenly, you know, long before uh, the uh, the Bond villain that we've referenced a number of times, Mr. Musk comes along with Tesla, you know, somebody else had already come along 15 years before with what was the, the coming electric car manufacturer in the U.S. or globally. I, I think that's a really interesting idea just because what we had also discussed is that we're not sure if solar and wind in the United States become what they do because they are not seen as necessary. But I also feel like if our – I'm going to call it fixed generation capacity, if our – the the side of the electric world of of the power world more specifically that comes out of that plug in your house is more eco friendly i think more of the research and more of the attention is paid to the part of the power universe that is mobile your car Right. So specifically battery technology, I think that's one that's a place where if we're not thinking about PV cells, if we're not thinking about other ways to try and keep what is the majority of the power generation universe cleaner, then that's then we can actually pay attention there. Right. And, um, and the other thing that you know, we, the other thing we were talking about off podcast, we had a great. Off, we had a great off off podcast conversation because we haven't had one in a while because of the things that have been going on. But, you know, Chris and I were talking there just generally uh, about you know geopolitics and the other things that have gone on with this. But uh, if you imagine the scenario where there's, as you say, the later development of solar or, or different thinking about how solar gets developed and how the technology gets developed around that, where you're less dependent upon oil as a general part of the mix here, maybe there's more electric cars that are going on is all of the things around the politics that, that were the domestic politics part of, of the equation also maybe get changed a little bit, you know, is, 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 is there as much of an inconvenient truth that Al Gore is having to tell us about? Is there a same, you know, boom in Texas in the, in the nineties after the, the eighties oil crunch uh, that, you know, sets up a George, a George W. Bush to be in a position where he can, you know, run run for national office. You know, you have all these little other little things that may just be corollaries to a different what's going on in the power world, but a real part of what's going on in the power world. Something else that's going through my mind right now that I find really interesting is you are now seeing, I'm going to say Detroit, getting into electric vehicles. What if electric vehicles become a thing, become both technologically te technologically feasible and um, what what if that shift happens before deindustrialization, the deindustrialization of the Rust Belt? happens in the mid 90s with the opening of china with the increase in global trade what if this whole energy economy oh and and you keep hearing people talk about well we can retool these old factories for this or for that 
what if the factories are still open? Right. They're just producing they're producing an, an electrically powered vehicle versus mm-hmm. an internal combustion engine rolling off, for example. Just using the auto exa- industry mm-hmm. as an example. Right. Or some or something I know that you know a thing or two about, you know, one of the big things when um natural gas was becoming as plentiful a resource as it started to become now over a decade ago, you know, they were talking about primarily for uh for trucks for mm-hmm. tr- transportation 18 wheelers you know or, and trains for example that would be natural gas powered you know what if you had some of the capabilities there it's hard to imagine the electric uh, the electric semi truck although i know i've read and heard things about that too that you know theoretically we may be moving there in the battery technology but if you had more of that sort of rippling through all of those economies in such a way that you know it, it changes if you change the electricity mix you change a lot i guess is the point without mm-hmm. getting without beating, belaboring that point or beating it to death is that it matters for a lot of different industries as you're talking about for a lot of right. different ways right and um, and one of the interesting things again because i was in this in things related to this industry as the natural gas export has really started to fire up a lot of the natural gas that's that's produced and that goes through the process of being liquefied in the United States are under 30, 40, 50 year contracts to the ultimate consumers here because they have to have that in place to justify the economics of building the liquefaction plants because they're incredibly expensive. And by the way, their energy, their energy intense in the process of what they do there. That's a whole other part of what's there. You have to, they have to be, they have to have a good source of energy to turn the energy into something that could be exported in the case of the natural gas. But for example, a lot of that natural gas is going to Asia for what? For electrical generation uh, being a good example there. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that's, it's all part of this, the global economy that's impacted by what's happening or not happening. And again, nuclear makes a difference here because we don't hear France being one of the nations in the current Ukrainian war worried about whether or nat- where their natural gas is going to come from. Mm -hmm. Why are they not worried about where their natural gas is going to come from? Or uh, they're less worried than they're less worried. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Then uh, for example, um, Mm -hmm. uh, a a Germany or uh, certainly, you know, a lot of Eastern Europe is in a very different scenario when it comes to that. Um, You mentioned uh, Chernobyl, thinking about Chernobyl and Three Mile Island in the same way. Mm -hmm. It would be remiss if we didn't talk about some of the, the concerns right now with the plant that's being impacted by the Ukrainian war. Mm-hmm. So do you think it was it's a fair thing to say that no Three Mile Island things change or maybe is it just a delayed reaction? Well, Three Mile Island wouldn't have stopped us. But wait a second, 86 Chernobyl. Do we no. really want to be building these things? Not at all. Um, Why do you think that is? What we were talking about off podcast is that I think nuclear disasters are national in that they are so heavily regulated. Each plant is regulated and each nation has its own set of regulations. You mentioned that on what the what is it? nuclear nes scale what 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 yeah the ines scale yeah ines scale chernobyl was a seven um and three mile island was a five on the list you're looking up right now does it list other incidents that we know about because i'll tell you right now yes we know about a seven that happened in the Soviet Union. How many others are on this list? Because this is one of the things that came out of it. They definitely hushed it up. And the only reason we know about Chernobyl is because the Swedish and the Western Europeans were detecting this radiation. Right. Lower level things 100% happened in the Soviet Union, and we did not hear about it. And I feel like, you know, not again, not to get overly technical, uh, maybe this needs to be a video episode because I'm about to give visuals. Um, 
American reactors were built with the reactor core and the rods are inserted from the bottom. Soviets were built the other way where the rods are lowered into the core. You know what that means? If the power spikes and if there is a problem in an American reactor, gravity takes over and the power rod falls out of the core. It stops generating power. Right. That is one of the things that caused Chernobyl is when the engine, when the mechanism inserting and removing the power rod malfunctioned, gravity took over and the power rod fell into the reactor. If I am not a nuclear scientist, but if it is that easy to make their designs sound that dangerous, their designs were dangerous. Right. They had other accidents. And and also just kind of thinking about we've talked a lot about France. Let's talk about Japan as well. If there's a single country in the world that we might expect to be a little hesitant about anything with nuclear in front of it, it's Japan. They were also very big on nuclear energy because they looked at Chernobyl. They looked at Three Mile Island and they said – we have a different regulatory regime. We build our plants differently. We inspect them differently. And it wouldn't happen here. Right. So if you have the United States looking at something going wrong in the Soviet Union, I don't think I, I think it's very easy for the United States to explain away. We we you know, we don't build things like that. We inspect them more we have more safeguards yeah and the other interesting thing about this scale i'm now didn't know this scale existed so again <laughs> one of the reasons i like doing a podcast we learn stuff by the way it's a logarithmic scale chris okay one to seven so it's it's not just you know a little bit it's orders of magnitude more severe and uh there are um there's only been four accidents, like as best I can tell here in history, that rated the scale of a seven. Uh, and of a seven? Of a seven. Um, a seven is Chernobyl, correct? A seven is Chernobyl. Uh, there was a, uh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Fukushima and Chernobyl were both sevens. Okay. Three Mile Island was a five. Correct. Uh, there was an event in uh, Russia uh, in 57. That rated yep. a six. Yep. Uh, and then you go below that, and you get down into not that they're not important, but the fours, threes, twos, and ones, because it's a logarithmic scale, are not nearly as as dangerous. All of them are dangerous, or else they wouldn't be monitoring them as the five, sixes, and sevens. And, and, and sitting right there looking at the list, um, if you would like to share your screen, I might be able to read it. Um but does do you know where that was? The six that you're talking about right now in 57? It was, um, it, you should be able to see it on, well, maybe if I share the screen properly here, you'll be able to see Oh, it. My, Mayak. Yep. Okay. Mayak was one of their research facilities for, so that that's kind of them, like we were talking about earlier, that is them trying to figure out where, um, how to how to control this right uh but i i you know uh, okay i looked into this kind of stuff um nobody else has ever heard of this yeah because it's it, it was sealed off it was in a closed facility and it was worse than what we just talked about shutting down american plant construction right well, and the other interesting thing here, I hadn't seen this when we were doing the, the prep work before the podcast. There are events here in France that are on this yes. chart that we happen to be looking at right now, but they're on the lower end of the severity spectrum. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, the thinking there is, okay, we learned from that and we will get, get better at it. You know, yes, mm -hmm. we had this 1993 level two incident in, in France. We had a, uh, there's an event here that's listed as a, as a four in 1980. So about the same time as mm -hmm. Three Mile Island. That did not detour the French nuclear industry. 
they they took the lessons from it. They learned, as you said, you know, regulatory regimes, and mm-hmm. okay, they they kept going. Such now that three quarters of three quarters of the electricity generated in that particular Western European country is nuclear, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and it's been thirty years. <laughs> It was 30 years almost between in the United States between even thinking about licensing a new plant just because of the one instant that was there. So it definitely right. changed the trajectory. Right. So any any final lessons, any final thoughts from this, Chris? Um, I, I, just to kind of think about getting really into what I used to do. Um, we're thinking about these nuclear incidents. There's a town in Canada that doesn't exist anymore called Lake Megantic. And what happened is one of these trains, they call them bomb trains, coming out of North Dakota, malfunctioned and blew up and took out most of the town. Um, there's no free lunches. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Um the other thought I have, two more thoughts. Uh, one, gee, if we went to a non greenhouse fuel source, maybe we don't even have this topic because it's not above 100 degrees every day for the upcoming week for you. <laughs> Uh, you, you know, you make an excellent you make an excellent point there, Chris, in the sense that it's you know part of the again what struck me what even caused me to suggest this when we were talking about a topic that you and I could do that wasn't sealing a topic that we knew the rest of our contributors wanted to be a part of. So we, I, we were, I, I, I e killing some president. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or uh, or, uh, or or still trying to prevent a world war that it's impossible to prevent except in one unique instance, but. Uh, but your point is your point is spot on there, Chris. Because what the other the other major change that can happen if there's no Three Mile Island is not just what's happened since then to date, because we know what the period is here. But you know, I'm firmly convinced. with we we avoid we avoid politics a lot. You know, we talk mm-hmm. around it on the podcast for the reasons that we do. But there's no doubt that our future history over the next couple of decades is also going to be dominated by the impacts of what's going on with climate change. However, you fall on the spectrum of how insignificant or severe you believe that is it's already playing into our our global politics it's certainly playing into national politics here in the united states it will continue to have an impact and if we weren't doing if we had just slowed that down as a result of a little bit more nuclear by one of the largest energy producers and consumers in the world in the united states you know would that have a change on where we are and where we're going the answer i think is yes you know, there, there's mm-hmm. there's no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Um, here's the last thought. <sighs> Jr. doesn't matter. Nobody cares who shot him. <laughs> if you don't have the oil boom in northern northern Texas, northern Texas, okay. I am not talking about your very highly skilled refining capacity down in texas i am talking about a bunch of cowboys running around sticking rods in the ground like beverly hillbilly style north texas just you're talking about yankee Te- you're talking about yankee texas that's a different thing than real texas but there you um, know there you go it, 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 dallas isn't a thing dallas a tv show not a thing it, it's less of a thing dallas would still be a thing but I, it, uh, it, but, but I, but but I, but I do believe the path of you know when you were hitting upon earlier this is very very interesting to me I do think the path of solar and wind mm-hmm. in this country would have taken a very different route if nuclear were more there because they've sort of picked up the slack of what would have been the nuclear component mm-hmm. uh, in our in our electricity generation stack literally that's what they call it the stack although what's different there and where, where this really comes into play is you can't make for example, uh, wind power, mm-hmm. very much of your base stack because it's not consistent. And it's also with both solar and wind, you know, I, I, I mentioned something earlier. I, I said a little flippantly, but the thing you need to build a nuclear plant is a lot of water. 
the good thing is humans also need a lot of water. Right. So, for example, I'm I'm not familiar with where the South Texas project is, but there's a plant right up the Hudson River from New York City. You can build nuclear plants if they're regular, you know, and, and I know there's a great movie about that as like a nightmare scenario. But if it's controlled, well, you you saw Three Mile Island. It is visible from the state capital of Pennsylvania. You your nuclear plants can be built very close to your consumption right. because your consumption follows people that needs just the water. That's all it needs, as opposed to I just happen to know that one of the larger solar plants is built in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Uh-huh. And and um, and there's a in, in Texas, for example, and this is true in other parts mm-hmm. of the U.S., but in Texas, the the wind generation is very rural in terms of mm-hmm. where it is. West Texas, uh, just because of the site you know, visible, the uh, the 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 visibility pollution, the just the mm-hmm. large, ugly wind turbines you know, kind of thing is, is actually become a thing here in the state of Texas. And you're right. Uh, it, it makes a difference being able to put your generation capacity near your consumption when you're talking about electricity. There's there's a big plus to being able to do that. It, it, you you lose electricity right. if, if you have to transport it over a large area. Yeah. And, and, you know, part of what then you do is then you shift some of those fuel sources to other, you know, well, it's producing electricity out in Arizona where you might not be able to do that. Well, that's where you then shift mm-hmm. the other capacity capabilities out there because you're able to move that stuff around. All right. I don't know if we solved anything, Chris, because I don't know if we ever solved anything, but I thought it was interesting just to sort of explore, you know, what would it be like if um, Three Mile Island were not in our vocabulary as a nation? I, 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 the other thing, I think this is a really interesting episode for us just because it's not narrative. I think we touch here, we touch there. It's not a story behind all of it. Oh, I agree. I agree. But because it's hard to it's hard to figure out what that story would would look yeah. like or what that story would be. Or, yeah. or 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 you know, we could go down the road of talking about geopolitical instability because of a lack of the oil. But then we start getting off into just throwing stuff against the wall which we've done sometimes but but yeah i agree all right um chris good to, good to visit with you both off podcast and on, and on the air so to speak good to see you mm-hmm. appreciate you joining me today we appreciate our listeners for joining us here on a fork in time uh we keep telling you we're getting back in the swing and slowly but surely we are uh again as we've often said here we have these things called real lives that get in our way of this fun thing that we get to do so so stick with us we'll be back with another episode soon chris i am going to suggest uh, to our listeners possibly if they come along a fork in time do you have any idea about what maybe they should do take it thanks for listening to a fork in time the alternate history podcast Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash aforkintime. We hope you will join us next time.